And of course, it wouldn't be the off season without you know canvas work and sewing. Um, the, the sewing machine is back together, and we are um, in the process of rebuilding the spray hood. Effectively, what what the problem was was this. I made the mistake, I erred in the design by trying to do one big glass panel and we just put our, our spray hood up and down way too often uh, and, and because of it, it folds funny in certain areas and eventually cracks the plastic. Uh, same thing happening over there. So the new version will be different um, along with some uh, adjustments um, to fit and finish. There's areas like this that obviously need to just didn't fit quite right. And I'll get that fixed as well. Sunbrella. It's amazing how quickly you go through canvas when you live on the boat full time. I'm not going to do a whole um, tutorial on sewing or anything, but here we are rebuilding the, um, the spray hood a little bit on the front to try to uh, get the folds in the plastic to work better. When we put the spray hood down, which is something that we do almost every day to get more air flow through uh, the cockpit, this this area just gets a beating on it. So um, I'm breaking it into, th into five panels instead of one big long panel. All my windows are now labeled um, so that I can make sure I don't sew them in backwards somehow, which is always a risk. Uh, but I think this is coming along pretty well. It's about three hours worth of work here to get this put together. And now the hard part is going to be to sew it in. You want to sew, you want to sew the windows in while they're, while it's still on a large piece of fabric. Uh, you, if you try to cut it open, it'll be impossible to keep it square. So what you do is you sew it straight down to the fabric and then come back later and cut the window fabric out on the back side. Um, that's the trick. Yeah, and then once you get the, the window glass sewn on, you just kind of pinch the fabric and, uh, and cut into it with a pair of scissors. And then, you know, you, you basically just cut crossways diagonally across and, and fold the flap underneath. And so it's kind of important that you, that you, um, that you sew the panels, the glass panels in really at the edge of the, of the binding tape so that you leave yourself some room to tuck this under. But that's the, that's the way to do it. It's um, it's it's not that hard. It's uh, and it's a nice it's a nice finished edge. Um, once you're done, so here you see I'm cutting this open and the glass is underneath. And then the trick is you cut it kind of right to where the binding strip is um, at the corner because you don't want to go all the way to the edge. You need to go right to there with your cut, and then that'll allow you to fold under. Um, and we'll see that in a second. So you just fold it, give it a good folded edge, and then with new Sunbrella, it's got kind of a resiny um, surface on it, so you can tuck it in and get a good fold on it, and it'll stay there. It'll, it'll continue to, you know, um, and that'll make it nice. You don't have to pin it or anything like that. You just fold it and, and, and get a good crease in the fabric, and then you can um, go ahead and uh, so it just top stitched the whole thing all the way around. A job like this wouldn't be complete without having some major error. And I sewed the whole upper section across the top. I sewed, sewed this new panel on backwards yesterday and had to, had to rip the stitches out and start from scratch. And that sucks. I just hate that. It's that hours of additional work for no reason. And it's one of the reasons why canvas work is so expensive. Um, and the, the the customer's expectations are completely out of line oftentimes with what what it takes to put something like this together. If you if you're mass producing these types of things in a in a canvas shop um, for oyster or Beneteau or Genoa or something like this, and you've got 50 of these to make or 20 or 10 or whatever, you get really good at following the pattern. The pattern is perfect. It's easy to make the stitches go well, and the people do it all day long. It's their real job. Um, so uh, you get what you get when you do these things yourself, but I also like to think that I put the extra time in um, to at least make it durable. And I think that's an important part of the whole thing. 
making sure that it's 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 not going to collapse when a big wave comes across the bow. Mm. One thing I'll note while I'm pinning this here is that if you watch people who do this for a living, they'll almost always have a, a pin cushion that they can wear on their wrist, and they just fill it up with pins, and that's that speeds things up tremendously. Uh, because picking a pin out each time I need to put one in out of this little thing is taking forever in a day. Um, and, and, and it could be avoided relatively easily, but I don't have one. That's kind of the problem. Sorry, but that, don't have it. Well, here we have all the uh, cockpit cushions laid out, the fabric for them. Um, the, the trick with this is I've got the insides marked um, port and starboard and obviously these get sewn inside out that's the way things get done and the, what I'm doing right now is just making sure that all my pieces are marked properly before I go to sew them because I found out as I disassembled one of the old cockpit cushions that they had made a mistake and put one in backwards um, which we never noticed but that's how it went and so um, one of the things about Sumbrella that's that's really, really nice is that there is no in or out to the fabric. There's no inside um, facing. You can use either side uh, as your finished side. And that is super helpful when you have trapezoidal style um, pieces of fabric because you can cut them either way and then flip them over and you have a lot less scrap. And Sumbrella is very expensive. You don't want more scrap than, than you can get away with. It's a bit off topic for a cruising sailboat channel, but if you're going to be sailing full time, you're going to be going through canvas. And if you're going through canvas, you can you can save yourself quite a bit of money and and have some fun actually. If you want to if you want to try to sew stuff yourself, but it really requires using a big you know one of the big industrial uh, um, uh, heavy duty machines. And to do so, you, you want to you really want to get what they call a compound walking foot sewing machine. And a compound walking foot is different than some of the other walk you know, machines out there that are advertised as, walk, as, as being a walking foot machine. What happens with the compound walking foot is you'll notice that the, that the needle comes forward and goes back with the foot. So both the grabber at the bottom, the bot what we would call the bottom foot, the top foot, and the needle all run together and then they come back. And what that does is it pulls the fabric through with the needle. It makes it virtually impossible to get a stitch that's not um, that's not consistent. And um, and you really kind of use big stitches on these on, on when you're sewing this type of fabric anyway, because you you don't want to tear the fabric. You want to you want to use the, the thread to hold. You, you don't want the thread the holes with the thread too close together. So I'll give a couple of suggestions about setting up these industrial sewing machines for working with the heavy canvas. Um, we use Tenera thread, which is um, a very, very tough thread. It comes on a cone. It's very expensive. Each one of these cones is about $140. Uh, but it is like Dyneema thread. It is absolutely impossible to break. So that's that's what we use. And it's a tough thread to work with because it doesn't. it tends to coil like this. And if it gets a kink in it, It'll run through the system until it hits the needle and then kind of lock up because it can't pull the knot through the through the eye of the needle. Um, generally speaking, the trick is to balance the stitches so that they look like this on the top and then also on the bottom have a similar look. If there's just a straight string of of a thread on the bottom, um, then it means the tension up on the top isn't tight enough to pull the thread through. Um, it also helps to use a very big needle when you're using Sembrella fabric because it needs a big hole. And if the hole, if, it's, if you're using too small a needle, the hole that it punches through the fabric is too small and grips the thread and doesn't allow it to pull back together and meet in the middle. Okay, so here I have a, a piece of fabric um, that, that's doubled over. This is a typical Sembrella fabric. And I'm going to start just sewing a stitch. And what I want to do is I want to look and, and see see if the stitch is, uh, is is up to is up to snuff here. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to we're going to give it a give it a shot through. Okay. 
like so. Now we're going to take a look very closely at the stitches. This is the top and this is the bottom. And these are examples of exactly what you're looking for. You want the thread on the bottom to go into the fabric um, where, where, where it goes and loops around the top thread. Okay, so what you want, you don't want just to see a straight string um, across. An example of a straight string across is like this. Notice the white thread. It's, uh, this was a very, very thick, heavy type of thread, and we were doing some work to try to adjust the machine for it. Um, but the first couple of attempts looked like this. This is the bottom. This is what happens on the bottom. So the upper thread tension isn't enough to pull the lower thread up through the fabric. Um, so instead, it just leaves it at the bottom, loops the upper thread around, and pulls the needle back out. Um, on the top, it looks fine. Everything's good on the top. But this type of a, of a, of a, of a seam is going to be weak because the bottom thread can be, literally be pulled out. If it breaks someplace, it can just slip right out of all those little loops. So you don't want that. So what's going on with this thread is that I, th I think there's a good chance that the needle itself wasn't big enough. You have to punch a big enough hole through the fabric that you can pull a double thickness of thread up through it. And if you're using a very, very lightweight needle, um, it's not going to do that. It's going to basically strain the lower, the lower uh, thread in place and, 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 and not be able to pull it up through the hole. Um, so you have to use a pretty big needle. I'm using a 21 needle on this machine right now. I would prefer a 22, but I ran out. Um, and you're going to need a lot of needles because they get damaged and worn. The umbrella fabric is very, very tough on, on, um, on needles. Uh, so anyway... Now let's talk about thread tension. So what are you going to do if you if if your lower thread isn't pulling through? Well, one of the things you can do, and usually the big, the starting point, is these adjustments here. You can tighten this this one in particular, the top one. If you tighten that, I don't want to make too many adjustments with this because it's dialed in. But if you need to tighten the upper thread, you you do it here. If you need to loosen the upper thread, you do it here. There's also a very very small um, very, very small uh, uh, screw on the bobbin, and we're going to go take a look at that now. So let's take a look at the bobbin case. This is the bobbin case, and inside there is a bobbin like this one. By the way, I always like to roll about three bobbins worth of thread every time I have to do it, because every time you run out of bobbin thread, you're going to need to, you're going to need to re reload. Um, and with these big machines, you'll notice the bobbins are a lot bigger. They hold a lot more thread, and um, so you go a lot longer before you need need more thread. But then on the other hand, this Tenera thread that I'm using um, is uh, is the, the lifetime thread that some that sell right sells, and you can get it elsewhere. is extremely thick and 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 takes up a lot of room on the bobbin. So you can take the bobbin out. It just drops out like so, and there's the bobbin case. And if you need to adjust the bobbin tension, the lower thread tension, you do it here with this little screw. And you'll need a jeweler screwdriver to do that. Uh, so you take that and if you just tighten that or loosen it. It doesn't take very much. A quarter turn of that screw really adjusts the, um, the thread uh, dramatically. And so you don't want to you really want to go little baby steps to try to find you know if you can get the, 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 the adjustment tension properly. When we put the bobbin in, we we pretty much just lay it in the bobbin case like so, and then pull it through the little thing. And it's different on different machines, but but generally this is how it's going to be. And then once that's like that, you just pull this little lever out, which locks the bobbin in place, and we throw it in just like that let me make sure that the threads hanging down not caught on anything there we are and now when we want to when we want to pull that thread through and bring it up we hold on to the thread the upper thread we drop down and you can see it hook onto the lower and there it is I'll just use a seam ripper here to kind of pull all this through and we're ready to sew. Okay, so what happens 
if you're skipping stitches. <clears throat> if stitches are skipping on the machine, it means almost certainly one of two things is happening. One is the needle has developed a hook on the end of it from hitting metal. Um, and that can happen if you're trying to pull the fabric. Um, since the walking feet machine, the compound walking feet machine, and by the way, the difference between a compound walking foot and a non-compound walking foot is there are machines out there where this foot and the grabber foot, the lower foot, run back and forth and pull the and pull the uh, the fabric through. Um, but the needle itself doesn't step forward, and so therefore it's not considered a compound walking foot. If you wanted to really up the game, you would go with a zigzag compound walking foot machine. Um, and zigzag machines are all by almost by definition, they're still going to be straight stitch machines because you can always set the zigzag number to zero, which is a straight stitch. And so you're good there. Um, and the highest level of all of this is what's called a four point zigzag. And that's where the, 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 the needle lap actually goes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, all the way through the, through the, the cycle of, of the zigzag. And that gets you a lot of penetration through the fabric with thread um, while still having the ability of the thread to handle stretchiness. And this is why you'll see that sails are almost always done with zigzag stitches. And since they're sail lofts, they use zigzag for pretty much everything. So the bags and everything else get zigzag stitches too. Uh, but that's that's the point. That's how, how it works. But our, ours is a compound walking foot straight stitch machine. There's no zigzag function for it. And I wish I had the zigzag function, but it tends to be a lot more money. Um, okay, so we're back to needles. You can usually hear the needle when it's getting dull because it's hooking on the fabric and you can feel it making a snapping noise as it comes through the fabric and it's actually tearing the, um, the fibers of the fabric as it does that, which means that if you have to seam rip anything, it's going to, uh, it's not going to look pretty. And you, you, you're just basically, once you start feeling like the, the needle is dull, you're gonna have to replace it. And they're just disposable items. So that, that's the thing, they come in packs of about 20 anyway, uh, for that reason. Now, the last thing, if you're, if you're, stip, if you're literally skipping st stitches if, if every like 50th or every 10th stitch is skipping um, so that the thread just skips from one stitch across where it should go into the next and so you've got an area of, of thread um, that's, that's, that's obviously not hooked on the bottom. The place to look, <clears throat> and this took me a long time to figure this out, if the needle strikes this area here or any area on the bobbin case, that's most likely the reason that you that you're that, that you're getting a skipping stitch because that little burr on the corner of the bobbin case is going to catch the thread and prevent it from from slipping or looping around the bottom of the bottom case and catching for the next stitch. And the solution when that happens is you need to get yourself some these are just little tiny pieces of emery paper of, of wet dry sandpaper very very fine one of these is 2500 and the other is 1000 and so the 1000 for cutting it down and the and the 2500 for really getting that last little bit of polish on the bobbin case there's also something called a shuttle and the shuttle has like a, a hook on the end of it that comes around and grabs the thread and loops it around and uh, that can be hit and damaged as well, but less likely. But these, those are the culprits for skipped stitches nine times out of 10. So one more thing I wanted to mention was, you know, regarding thread tension. Um, the, uh, the tension on these, on these machines is, is, is an interesting thing. The, uh, the temptation is always to tighten the thread anytime that you've got an imbalance between the upper thread and the lower thread, the bobbin thread versus the versus the main thread. And you can do that with these heavier fabrics um, and get away with it. In fact, they like a lot of thread tension and, and the, the machines do have a tendency to break threads if they're not Tenera thread. And Tenera thread is the, is the preferred thread for the marine environment. Uh, most, most canvas projects fail because the thread rots out and you won't have that problem with um, with, with Tenera. I, I think it's a form of Dyneema actually because it's very hard to cut through with a hot knife, um, very resistant to he high heat and that's kind of how Dyneema is. But be that as it may, uh, the, the, the thing with thread tension is 
if you're sewing light fabrics like gauzy curtains and um, uh, you know cotton, um, if you tighten up the if you tighten up the thread tension too much, it'll just start bunching the stitches and pulling, gathering the the fabric together, and you really don't want to do that. You want to uh, you, you want to always be balancing the threads, and that's one of the reasons why. Um, there's actually separate machines. They're, they're, they do make walking stitch or walking foot machines, rather, but they um, in, in in a smaller, lighter weight versions. And so you you know you have to be careful when you're buying these machines that you're buying the right type of machine. Uh, but this thing will will sew through sh through shoe leather, um, probably two or three layers of it, and uh, and and be happy all day long about it. This thing this is a Juki uh, 241H. Um, and it is a beast and they, it really does get the job done. This is for for heavy canvas and leather uh, is what, what this machine's designed for. Um, and it's geared down so it has a lot of torque. It really will like power its way through almost anything. In fact, if you get your finger or something in there, it'll just suck it right on, right on through. So you have to be very careful. But so, 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 so be aware of thread, of balancing the threads top and bottom, but also making sure that you have the proper thread tension. Um, and you really probably want to um, want to want to be aware if you if you're sewing lighter fabrics that you may have to loosen everything up. As far as stitch length goes, I've got this this one set to five, um, and I don't know what the numbers equate to. I don't think it's millimeters, but because uh, that will be a pretty big, it'll be half a centimeter, and I don't think that that would be. That's not what we're using, but uh, but on the scale, it's it's five. And it's a pretty decent stitch. Um, it's uh, you don't want the stitches too close together. I, again, the problem is you'll perforate the fabric and 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 cause it to rip uh, the rip a, a section of the fabric all the way along. You need the the the, the th on on heavy canvas work um, with very strong Tenera thread. You don't need the stitches to be particularly close together. It's usually better if they be. Um, I think these are probably about an eighth of an inch apart. Um, and uh, as you can see, this is how the thread goes through these. If you notice, I've got some loops around here. And again, that's because I wasn't able to get the thread tension tight enough. So I, I ran these around in circles and they're designed uh, so that you can do that. That's, that's, that's the reason why they're soft around all the edges um, in order to get that to work. And then of course, lubrication. Lubrication is huge on these machines. This one, the previous owners put red markers on all the holes. Um, that need it, but but in in reality, you just have to have to. There's a there's a manual that goes with it that will tell you where the lubrication points are, but pretty much everywhere that there's a hole, it gets it gets it gets oil, um, and and the bottom that even has an oil tank um, that that gets that stays full um, during during normal operation. And there's a bunch in the back as well. I'm also using um, a so quiet um, motor um, to drive this with. This is a little different motor than, mo than most that are out there. The clutch motors are very, um, take a lot of skill to operate because they use a, a kind of an arm that you use, you, let, you, you basically use your knee to push the arm back and forth to engage and, um, and release the clutch. And I, I think it's a little extra work and it gets the torque by keeping the motor running all the time. So they, they make a, a humming sound as they're running. Um, this one here instead uses a very high torque motor. Um, and this, although this motor was a bit more expensive than the clutch motors that are out there, um, I think it's really worthwhile. It's a great, great uh, addition to the machine. You just you don't have to use the balance wheel to to get the to get the machine started. It, it will absolutely start on its own. Just a little push of the treadle, and it, it's off and going. Here's an example of how much control you have with this motor. Just with my foot alone, I can I can run this around, and it just. It is really, really nice to be able to do that. It's it's almost impossible to get a home sewing machine um, to do that kind of, that that sort of thing. The the, in the and to be fair, the reason for that is that the the machines are designed to be compact and lightweight, and so the motors just aren't that powerful, and they can't uh, they can't handle the just like torque. It's the it's the it's the ability of the of the motor to start something from a stop. Um, that's uh that's that's the important feature. 
This is what a swing away binder looks like. It's a, a tool that attaches directly to the sewing machine, as you can see. And although they're somewhat expensive, $75 to $100 on sale right, you'll absolutely need one if you're trying to use binding tape. Um, it doesn't really work otherwise. I think that came out fairly well. This is how it came out in the end. I mean, it could be be a little tighter and snugger around some of the areas but you know um, we also don't have the straps pulled absolutely as tight as we possibly could go just make sure that this folds properly all the way through same on this side just making sure that we have no no places where the spray hood bends funny. 